Okay. So we are now starting with Plato. So I always do this. When I start a new book, we do a poll, right? To figure out um, how, how you experience the text. So remember, number 10 is it was amazing. Best thing ever happened to you. One is like horrible. You want to throw up uh, and so forth. So let's see. Are there any 10s for Plato? Put your hand in the screen if you think it's a 10. Okay, no 10s. Nine. Eight. All right, go guys. Eight, seven. Okay, Abbas. Good, Ramos. Six, five. Here come the haters now. Four, <laughs> three, two. Oh, oh, die. <laughs> two, one, zero. Oh, Hassan, you you raise your hand for number one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, let's start with the haters. Hassan and Dai, what happened? <laughs> um, um, the book, I, th it's, I feel like it's all over the place. Like, um, <laughs> they talk about one thing, then they go to another part while well, extension like, what they're talking about. Like, I was kind of lost reading the whole page. <laughs> Yes, it's dialogue, so it's one after the other, right? It's a party, it's supposed to be chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> you got the idea, if it's chaos, you're in the right place. <laughs> uh, Hassan, Hassan, why, what happened to you? Oh, okay, so I was explaining this to my group, and I'm, I, I don't know why they didn't put a one with me. I don't know, they left me, <laughs> they left me, but... um. So the first thing is I'm I know I know how Plato writes his philosophy. I'm I'm not I'm not um I'm not new to Plato. It always starts out with which I find is corny. One person in Athens walks up to Plato. Do you remember this event that happened so and so? And they try to recall it, and then the dialogue begins, like the five dialogues by Plato. Not my favorite way to approach philosophy, but it it is what it is. Um, but the problem I had was it Greek philosophy the way that they do it does not really fit with the spirituality of love when it comes to me personally. It did not, it did not address uh, certain things. It did not have the same feeling. It did not have the same flow. It, um, I mean, when you're talking about knowledge and science and how to understand shapes and who's smart and who's not, yes, Plato, Socrates do amazing at that. When it comes to political science, they do amazing at that. But this, this whole conversation was very, they, they kept referring back to mythological gods that have no relevance toward me in the 21st century. <laughs> um, they kept, uh, their, their basis for many of their arguments are all fallacies. But to them, they made sense. To us, it's not going to make sense at all, especially when it comes to us. A, a very confusing concept like love, the philosophy of love. And the, one of the things that also um, I just didn't, I couldn't relate to was th a lot of them were talking, when they were talking about love, they were really talking about pedophilia. And, you know, I'm, I was trying to ignore that through most of the, um, the reading. But I just can't relate to these ancient Greek men who are trying to read poems and show off their masculinity to little boys who they're really, um, it's really pedophilia <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so I just didn't, um, it did absolutely nothing for me to try to help me understand love. Ooh, okay. Okay. You destroyed the text before we even open it. <laughs> so let me respond a little bit. Let me try respond a little bit and then we'll go to the lovers. If they still have the courage to <laughs> stand up after this. So, um, yeah, I agree with you in terms of love. They are missing. They have a huge, there is a blind spot in, in everything that they're saying, which we're going to point out, right? Absolutely. They, they are all talking in a way uh, in this, with the same blind spot. And we're going to talk about it. And this is maybe what you're sensing, right, is, is missing. So, uh, uh, interestingly, in the dialogue itself, the, the person of Diotima kind of... Um, arranges right she she brings the other perspective as we'll see next time so yes um i agree with you something is missing uh, probably because it's all male audience so they have only one perspective right they're missing the whole other perspective of the woman which eventually comes more or less uh with the ultima we'll, we'll talk about that yeah they, they send away the flute girl and they they really take all the women like in the uh, the mid uh midway through the reading 
they're like, oh, you know what? Let's all decide to send away the flute girl and any type of entertainment <laughs> and all the women, put them in one room and let them entertain each other. I was like, exactly. oh, so, I was like, That's okay. That's the problem. That's maybe what's missing, right, in the text. Um, so I, I appreciate that comment. Now, with regards to pedophilia, remember, right, the young men are in their late teens. They're not children anymore, right? These are the high school seniors. They're entering political life. They're just on the verge of becoming men. So pedophilia is, uh, you know, children. <laughs> so, I mean, not that, you know, I'm not going to go on and fly banners for this practice, right, that they're doing, but uh, I hesitate to call it pedophilia, to be honest, because these are young men who are really young adults, right? So, um, but like I said, Plato himself seems uncomfortable with the practice, at least Socrates, right? Uh, he, in fact, refuses to, 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 to go into this, um, to enter this dynamic. So we, we sense that Plato himself is slightly uncomfortable, right, with the practice, as, as it is uh, uh, in the form of a... Um, exchange. He, he doesn't like the kind of, you know, I give you this, you give me that, right? Um, but yeah, um, I can see how it would be difficult. And remember, I told you, a lot of these texts, they are remote from us, right? They're from another time. They're quoting other gods, right? They're a different culture. This is the challenge, right? Can we still learn? This is one of the challenges of the class. Are you capable of learning from anybody? There's a quote, I don't know in which tradition, which says the wise man is capable of learning from anyone right? So are we going to be able to learn something from these guys, right? Okay, Levental, yes, you want to add something? <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I thought that, like, the, the first guy who spoke, it was a lot about, like, the, 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 those odd relationships, but the other speakers, it was more about, like, I mean, I could be wrong, it may have been all about, like, the, the sexual relationships with the younger men, but um, it kind of just seemed like they're talking about love in more of a broad, like, Yes. Um, they kind of were making it personal a little bit. I mean, it still was like abstract and like it wasn't like the itty gritty, but um, I thought there's a lot of nice things that they said about love in it. I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if you if you put it to like the pedophilia stuff, then it makes it, it like colors it a little gross. But <laughs> if you take that out, I thought some of the stuff was kind of nice. Um, yeah, okay, very good. Yeah. Of course, the question is, um, uh, you know, can we learn from people that do oh, kind um, of acts, right? I feel like um, the, I want to explain why it's a one, not a zero. Okay. Because it's not that I didn't get anything from it. <laughs> um, I like the part where in the beginning, they begin with saying how you have to drink wine, wine in moderation and everybody agrees, let's all drink wine in moderation only till you feel comfortable. Then at the end of the, the reading, it talks about how the same thing has to do with love. It has to be in moderation until you feel comfortable. Don't push yourself to uh, pass the limits. I, that, I learned from that. And also, um, I guess like when they're trying to show off to the younger men, they want to look tough and, you know, that type of love to look tough with your lover. It's also nowadays with like, um, you know, guys always try to look tough around their girlfriends. You know, you can't look like a punk. You got to beat people up, you know, who look at your girl for too long. You know, so those are, th I took some things from it. So it's not a, not a, not a, not a zero. It's just that in the philosophy of love, I didn't really get far in, uh, in Jacob's ladder. All right, very good, very good. Well, let's see the lovers. Let's see, I think that was uh, Dai, I think was, no, no, you were a hater, sorry. Wait, Gogas, I think, and Abbas, were you lovers? Um, I can't remember who else. You can raise your hand if I missed you. So let's hear a little bit from the lovers. Let's see if we can redeem <laughs> this text a little bit. So, um, would you like to say something, Gogas or Abbas? Yeah, I liked it just because I, um, not that I learned about Plato, but I am Greek, so it is kind of like going into like how I have learned, like growing up, like how things are. And at the end of the text that we read, what you get out of it is you have that sense of like something is being held back, and that's the truth that the truth is being held back until you can work your way up to getting that truth out of that person. Very nice. And that's how it goes with love in like Greek philosophy. That's how it goes with it, that you can't fully trust a person right away. That somebody has to earn your trust in order for you to open up fully towards them. Very good. I like that. The way that through the kind of the whole dialogue, the whole process is, is hiding, right? The, mm -hmm. 
the true meaning. So I, very, very nice, excellent. I like that a lot. Um, Abbas, did you want to add something to this uh, brilliant analysis? <laughs> um, so like the reason why like I enjoyed this reading was because like, I feel like there were like a lot of like hidden messages in everyone's speech. Like, like a pattern that I noticed is that like everyone kind of has like their own definition of love. Because I remember like one speech was about like medicine and how like medicine translates into love. And like um, something else I found really interesting is that like they kind of like teach their readers like what is like the right kind of love and like what is like the wrong kind of love. And I feel like like that relates to like like um, a lot of people nowadays because like we often don't know like if the relationship that we're in is like good or bad so it's like um i think that's when like they had like common love and like heavenly love or something like that and i think like the difference between the two types of love i think that's like um really important for like people to understand so i feel like if you look at it as like a whole picture instead of like focusing on like small details that like you might not be able to understand because it's like a reading that doesn't really take place in our time. I think like the bigger message is a lot more important. But like, I do agree that there were like a lot of parts that I was like a bit confused about. Like when it came to like, I don't know, it was like the love between like an older man and a younger, like it was a bit confusing, but I was like able to like kind of look past it and kind of look <clears throat> more like in between the lines type of way. Okay, very good. All right. So yes, sometimes we have to, it's, there's a debate right right now in philosophy. Um, and I'm seeing the two, the classes divided along these lines, right? So um, there's philosophers who are amazing philosophers, and then in their personal lives, they committed atrocities, right? And so there's a whole debate, should we still read them? right? Or philosophers who we, we realize now were sexist or racist or, you know, um, so the, there's a debate, right? Should we read someone's philosophy when they have this kind of personal life, right? Problematic personal life, or should we, like you guys do in the culture, cancel them because, ah, they said that, <laughs> right? So there's two approaches, right? There is an approach that says, I'm not going to read somebody's philosophy who, who in a way, if that person is racist or sexist and so forth, or you know, um, having weird sexual practices, right? I'm not gonna read that philosophy um, because for me, they have nothing to teach me because it shows me, right? There is this moral problem. And so therefore anything that emanates from them is gonna be tainted by this. So that's one view, which a lot of very famous philosophers have adopted actually among themselves, right? And then there's the other view that, well, the art transcends the artist, right? This is the view that the human is flawed, but what they have been inspired with is still beautiful. And it's really up to us to decide, right? Which, which, which um, I see both elements of both in this class, right? Um, so yeah, <laughs> very good. All right, let's see what we can get from this text. I guess I'm part of the, the group where the, uh, the art <laughs> is above the artist so um i'm gonna go and try and find what we can still learn from from you know some of these guys so i'm gonna actually look at three of them i'm gonna look at posanias i'm gonna look at aristophanes and then i'm gonna finish with agathon so those will be the three i'll be looking at and actually um what i'm gonna ask you is um I'm going to talk about each of them, but I want you to find, I'm going to ask you at the end of class, I want you to find the common denominator. In other words, they all have the same blind spots, right? One of you was talking about uh, Hassan, right? Was complaining about the blind spots. They all have the same blind spot and I'm, I want to see if you can find it. Okay, so I'm going to start talking innocently. We're going to learn from them, but then we will uncover their blind spots. So let's start with Posanias. Posanias is very simple right? Two kinds of love. This was what Abbas liked, right? Abbas, is that you? Let me check if I have the right name. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes, Abbas, <laughs> right? So higher love, lower love. Of course, in the context of the Greek culture, the higher love is uh, when you have higher love, who are you in love with? What kind of people are going to attract this higher love? Do you remember from the text? 
you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. <clears throat> okay, Levental, go ahead. Um, I think they said like the politicians were like the higher level, like smarter people, like intellectuals. That was another thing I also thought was weird because um, there was such a small percentage of society and I guess that's like how they were, but they were, uh, they were looking down on everyone like that. Like they were so almost like arrogant and haughty in their, what they knew, um, but it was obviously like not everyone. And Yes, they're the only ones that matter, Levinta, <laughs> right? That's that you got it. This is Hassan's problem. I think he's fuming somewhere in the class um, about this probably too, right? Absolutely, right? They, they are the higher love, <laughs> right? When one is attracted to them, when one is attracted to an old... Now, they give a good argument for it. We're going to look at the argument, but indeed, right? Higher love is when you're attracted to an older man. And lower love, who do you love when you're a victim of lower love? <laughs> A woman. A woman and? Who else? So the woman, but who else also is going to attract your lower love? And Hassan, this might answer your issue of pedophilia, actually. The younger man, right? So actually in the text, there is a condemnation, right? Of being with, with young boys, right? Uh, but not, not for moral reasons. <laughs> We're going to see why. So can anyone tell me why is it that to love a woman and a younger boy is lower love and to love an older man is a higher love? What's the explanation that is given in the text? Does anybody remember? <clears throat> uh, yes, Blades, go ahead. Um, the lower love speaks to an infatuation, um, whereas the higher love speaks to more of an intellectual kind of um, affinity. Very good, right? The higher love is higher why, right? Not because it's an older man, because it's a wiser man, right? The man has intelligence, knowledge, and so what you're really attracted to is the mind right? Whereas the woman who has no mind, <laughs> you know, no education at least, right? She has no conversation. The younger boy likewise, he's just cute, right? The woman is just beautiful. So what are you attracted to? Not the mind, you're attracted to the body, right? Now remember the allegory of the cave I gave you? When you're attracted to the body, where are you in terms of the cave? Inside or outside of the cave? <clears throat> Remember the uh, inside, very good, Leon, right? Absolutely, all of you are saying that. Right, so when you're attracted to the body, you're actually being drawn into the material world, right? You're in a way being sucked into the material world, whereas when you're attracted to an older man, that is to say to their intelligence, because they don't have much of a body anymore, right? You're interested in their intelligence. You're actually rising above the material realm into the realm of ideas, right? And so you're coming out of the cave. That's why for Posanias, right? Loving an older man, in, that is to say, loving the mind is better because you're coming out of the material world, which is the, how the Greeks think we should do things, right? We should not stay stuck in the material <clears throat> with material concerns. We should also have intellectual, ideal concerns, right? We should also be interested in the political life and equality, freedom, beauty, and so forth, right? <clears throat> That makes sense. So what can we learn, right? Well, it's very simple, right? As, as Abbas was saying, we can still learn something from this. We can learn that higher love is the love of the, not just the body, but the mind of the person. And lower love is when you're just infatuated with their body, right? So we can get this little gem, right? <clears throat> so there's a, a text which explains to us on page 16 why it is so important to stick to the higher love, right? So turn with me to page 16 to the last, <clears throat> uh, to the fourth line on page 16, a bad man, who, if you're there, put your hand in the screen, a bad man, okay. So he explains, right, why it's better to have the higher type of love, right? In addition to coming out of the cave, it's also the guarantee that your love will last longer. Right? That's the argument that he's making here on page 16. He's saying, if you love the mind, your love will last because the mind doesn't break down, doesn't decompose. Whereas if you love the body, after a few years, the body's finished, right? So what's left to love? Nothing. So your love will die. 
right? So that's really the argument. If, and the, the advice here is if you want lasting love, so this is, make sure you write this down. This is the main advice that we can extract from this passage. If you want your love to last, make sure you're also attracted to the mind of the person, not just to their body, right? You want to also have an, an emotional, intellectual, spiritual connection, right? Okay, here's the thing. Uh, a bad man in this connection is the lover of the common type who loves the body rather than the mind. And as a result, he says he's not constant because he loves something that is not constant. As soon as the bloom of the body fades, which is what attracted him, he flies away and is gone, bringing disgrace on all that he said and promised. Now here's the line you underline. Here's the sentence you underline rather. But the man who loves goodness of character is constant throughout his life. So if you're in love with the character of your beloved, right, your love will last because he has become united with something constant. Okay, so that's the first lesson we can get. Beautiful. See, we were able to learn. Hassan, how are you feeling? Little, we got a little bit of wisdom from this Pozanias guy, in spite of all of his crazy. Yeah. Feeling better, Hassan? <laughs> yeah, I do believe. Yeah, but... <laughs> I that, that, yeah I I I agree with that interpretation. It's just I don't. They just um, in this this uh this um, reading, it just wasn't shown well. Oh yeah, no the the, a, the, the, <laughs> the language for all of us is difficult to <laughs> to navigate. Absolutely. I'm trying uh, to think of um more um. Well, you, well, you already know my stance on like the power of knowledge when it comes to individuals. So they, I definitely agree with that. I'm trying to think of another um, philosopher, philosopher who wrote on that maybe more clearly. Okay, when you think of it, let us know. <laughs> okay, so now let's go to the second one, Aristophanes. Uh, now, Aristophanes is actually going to lay out the, this beautiful story, right, about the soulmate, right? So this is one of the, the most ancient stories or tales about this idea of the soulmate, which a lot of us believe in, right? A lot of us believe that out there, there is a special someone which fits us perfectly, right? So this is the, one of the most ancient stories. So can anyone tell us what is the story he tells? Can anyone summarize to us the story, this myth that uh, he talks about? Go ahead. The story goes, at one point in time, we were these like eight-armed, four-legged beings, that were like forever like attached to our like soulmate or partner and we were very powerful like we were powerful enough to kind of rival the god strength so what the gods did was in fear of us separated us into the you know into the two-legged two-armed individuals we are now and now we're always see oh, it'll be four-armed right we were always seeking our um better half owing to this um division that we endured from that mythological story. Okay, very good, right? Remember, a myth is not to be taken literally, right? Don't start thinking the Greeks are crazy idiots coming up with crazy stories. This is a myth. It means it has a meaning behind it. It's a story which has a philosophical meaning. And the deep meaning we're getting from the story is that, and we sense this, a lot of us have this intuition that there is someone that somehow I am missing something until I find that person who will puff, right, fit with me perfectly like a puzzle, right? And then I will be <sighs> complete, right? And this is really very, very common um, intuition that a lot of us have, right? So, okay, so let us assume that indeed there is a soulmate. The $1 million question will be, what does this soulmate look like? right? You don't want to miss your soulmate, right? Many of us do. We marry some idiot, right? And then 10 years later, we meet in the office, the soulmate, right? So it can become very complicated if you miss your soulmate, because now you have a family, you have kids, you have a mortgage, and there comes your soulmate. So it will be very useful. And the text actually going to help us figure out how to identify in a crowd of people, your soulmate. So this is very important information. Are you guys ready to meet your soulmate? Put your hand in the screen. What, nobody's ready? <laughs> okay, very good. A few of you are, some of you don't buy it. You become so cynical. <laughs> There's nothing, love doesn't exist, <laughs> right? But okay, let's assume he's right. <clears throat> that there is a soulmate. The key here, the urgent question is, what does the soulmate look like? So we have, the text is going to give us a hint of this. It's between the lines. So we have to be subtle and, and capture it. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to read. And as I'm reading randomly, you don't need to follow where I am. Just listen and try to think here, what is the common thread of what I'm saying? What's the common denominator? What's the idea that's coming up uh, over and over again? And then I'm going to ask you, based on what I read, what does the soulmate look like? So I'm going to start on page 27. Um, I'm just going to re read the top and then I'm going to go to page 29. So, so you guys ready? I'm just going to read. Put your hand on the screen if you're ready. I'm just going to read you. Just listen. And as I'm repeating, same concept, you should be able to have a portrait of the soulmate emerging from what I mean. So here we go. Um, okay. What is the ideal? That is to find a loved one who naturally fits your own character who is naturally close to us and who restores us to our original nature. Continuing. Love, oh shit, that's uh, not what I meant to read, sorry. <laughs> Reading before on page 25, right? Um, the, uh, some people, uh, those who are cut, right, um, from the male gender go for males, etc. They welcome the same qualities in others. Uh, we are always welcoming their shared natural character, meets that very person who is his other, other half, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and we become to the, uh, close to the loved one that are really our own. Okay, so I've just read random passages. Uh, anybody have any idea from what I was reading what the soulmate might look like? So he fits your own character. He's close to you. He restores you to your original. I'm, I'm sorry. Was that one quote from the bottom of 24 to 25 or were there two quotes? Several quotes. I read all mixed up. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> so what did you get? What's the impression you're getting that the soulmate looks like? You're welcoming the same qualities in others, welcoming their shared natural character, the other half. Restoring me to my original nature. What are you seeing there? Naturally fits my own character. Does the soulmate look different or like me? Very good, so wrestler, right? Very good. The soulmate looks exactly like you. Aha. Now, this is interesting. So how does this help you? Well, it helps you in the following way. What the text is telling you, now listen very carefully because this is important information. What the text is telling you that you will not find your soulmate until you have found yourself because the soulmate is a reflection of your best self. In other words, if you're still incomplete and you're like, you know, uh, not yet yourself and you're looking for yourself and you're not fully who you were meant to be you're going to attract all kinds of half-assed versions of yourself which is our problem <laughs> at in our 20s right we attract all kinds of weird people but actually we are we are mirroring they are mirrors of how imperfect and incomplete we still are until you have become fully yourself reached your highest self only then will you attract your full soulmate and not some distorted version of it. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is so important. And actually, it's not, it's not a bad idea to have in mind, right? In other words, before you can find your soulmate, you have to find yourself. Okay, let me say that again. Write it down. Before you can find your soulmate, you have to find yourself, right? And, and, and until you've reached your higher self, if you're still like a little half, half version of yourself, half assed version of yourself, you're going to attract that. If you are, and I'm going to just, I'm going to be very clear. If you're in a relationship right now where you're like, oh, this person is just, they're crazy. That's because you're crazy, <laughs> right? Anytime you're in a relationship with someone who's like giving you hell, you can look inside and see, not that you're a bad person, but you still haven't reached your full growth. And that's why you're attracted to someone who is also incomplete. I like you. Any relationship, know this. The other person is never the bad guy. They're just a reflection. <laughs> and so if they're crazy, look inside and you're going to find a bit of craziness in yourself too. And so the advice we're getting here is don't go out dating until you have found yourself. Because until then, you'll just attract, you know, broken pieces, right? 
Find yourself, take the time you need to work on yourself. Be single for 10 years if you need to, but get there. And then you are ready to attract your soulmate and not make the mistake of being with somebody who ends up being wrong, right? Okay, so that's the idea here. Okay, there's a hand. Wrestler, go ahead. Um, I just have a question on that. You were saying that um, like you have to kind of be like at the peak of your growth, right? Like not like wanting to grow anymore in order to like find your like find your soulmate. But like don't you think that like there's always more growth? So like wouldn't wouldn't you have to just be like content with where you're at, but like and understand who you are, but not like um meaning like there's always something to grow, like in. So you're talking like a Hebrew, right? Remember the Song of Songs? They grow together. They don't grow by themselves and then they meet and pop, it's a perfect puzzle, right? This is Greek, right? We're in Greece now. So in, in the Hebrew, they kind of become who they are, right? This is the difference. They become their highest self together. They, they mold each other, right? So it's a dynamic type of growth. In the Greek, it's different. You first become by yourself. This is the problem of Greek thought, in my view. This is one of the biggest flaws of Greek thought. Uh, sorry, Gogas, <laughs> our Greek, <laughs> all right? And one of the biggest flaws of Greek thought is that you can become a full version of yourself by yourself, right? And then you will fit perfectly, right? So now, to be fair to Aristophanes, you're only a half version of yourself since the other half is coming, right? But there, there is no notion, right, of growth or um, progress, right, in the Greek context. It's a little more static, right, the, the thinking. Um, okay, yes. Uh, Blades, you had a question. I'm running out of uh, battery. <laughs> oh, I was gonna add, even with these, um, I guess, weird reflections of yourself, they allow you to kind of make the understanding, owing to your um interpretation, that oh, this is also me. So I I would say that while I guess the tone of that makes it seem like you should not be in relationships, those relationships, be they, you know, intimate or friendships, also provide you with mirrors. If you're alone, then you don't have any mirrors. So yeah. you won't even come to understand yourself. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 what, what they're saying is the whoever is in your life is a mirror, right? So if you want to attract someone of high quality, become someone of high quality if you're with someone of low quality probably you you also <laughs> are suffering from low quality right so this is kind of a very profound idea actually there are problems with it we're going to talk about it but it's in, if you just look at it with you know um uh you know seriously it, it, it does make sense to a certain degree right um i saw another hand or uh, somebody appeared let's see who was it uh oh, yes um Evans, hold on, Evans. I'm going to answer your question in a second. I just need to uh, charge my computer. So just a second, uh, which means my camera will not be working anymore. <laughs> because it's an either or thing. <clears throat> it's the same outlet. So, sorry, guys. That's what you're going to get now. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me actually just put us on gallery view. That way um, we'll have some life. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so Evans is asking, um, what about people who say they become better people together? Yes, so this is... Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead, I Evans. No, it's already. Okay, that was you. Okay. <laughs> kind of like why you kind of like learn from your relationships, like anything that doesn't work out, you kind of like grow yourself because like maybe you see the qualities that don't mirror yourself yeah you're in the hebrew right you're in the hebrew <laughs> here you really this is an idea in the greek thought is you can you you should reach your full development right and then although again right i'm 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 hesitant to say that completely because it's still your other half but the idea is find yourself and only then will you be able to find your soulmate and there is um, some truth to that right I, I th hassan yeah i think when it comes to that, that, uh, that take on it, that also like the wine they were drinking has to be taken with moderation. Cause I really do like that idea that you have to find yourself before you actually find your soulmate. A lot of people rush into relationships when they're broken and just find another broken relationship. Um, like that, uh, Lauren Hill song, uh, do up, you know, how you go in if you're not right within, 
you know, that lyric says a lot, you know, you have to like pause, hold yourself back and try to analyze yourself. Are you good within yourself? Are you mentally stable within yourself? Are you understanding yourself? Do you have problems within your own life that you have to deal with before you try to put that onto someone else? Yeah, very good. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of our problems in relationships come because we're still incomplete, right? We haven't resolved these issues and now we bring them. And of course, they are reflected back, right, through our partner. Um, Lovental, you had a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, so when you say that, like, the Greek thought is that um, people, I guess, um, grow on their own and, and uh, become themselves on their own, do you mean, like, completely alone? Or you just mean, like, not getting into relationships that, uh, for, like, uh, I guess, like, for life or, like, looking to, like, to have a partner? Or do you mean like they just go off on their own and they just like spend time with themselves? Or you mean they just have like friends, they don't have anything like super serious? Yeah, so the idea is simply um, work on yourself, right? Before you, that's the idea. Work on yourself before you go in a relationship. You'll have a higher uh, chance of meeting your soulmate. That's what Aristophanes would say, right? Because whoever you are, that's what you're going to attract right so if you want to attract your true soulmate you have to become your true self right so that's so so that's so i'm just elaborating i'm saying you know work on yourself even if it means being alone for a bit it's better to work on yourself uh, with instead of like hassan is saying rushing into a relationship being a half-baked version of yourself you will get a half-baked version of your soulmate <laughs> that's the idea does that make sense Levinten? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. Any questions on the soulmate? This is crucial. If you want to meet your soulmate, this is the moment to ask the questions. Are we good? Are we getting this, right? That's work on yourself. If you want to meet your soulmate, take the time to meet yourself, right? Work on yourself. Become the highest version of yourself, and then you're ready, right, to attract your soulmate. Uh, Zimmerman, go ahead. <clears throat> so what would someone who is under the Greek philosophy say to a person who who responds that through a relationship like a lot of people have been saying that through a relationship you do find yourself also like it is possible that on an individual level you work on yourself and you find about you find out about yourself and you you then understand and you know and you've changed and you're not broken let's say let's say but then what would someone say to the afterwards and you're in that relationship then let's say in the greek society you're in the relationship and then is it not supposed to change you at all and you're not supposed to find out more things about yourself like how, what would they respond to it in terms of because a relationship I'm, not, I'm saying, I understand the Greek philosophy that it, it kind of stops there, but in terms of like an individual growth, um, it is naturally going to change you. That's what, that's what happens to relationships. So then what would they respond? So you're in, I would, I would, you're in the, you're in the Hebrew camp, right? That you grow in relationship, right? So, um, so it's, the Greek view is a little more, remember, the wisdom is not found in experience. You first find the wisdom intellectually and then you apply it. So this is similar, right? You first find yourself in isolation, kind of, right? Through yourself and then you offer that, right? So, so the, it's different, but, but both, right? I think uh, both are possible paths, right? The Hebrews are saying you can be completely immature and start your relationship and come out okay, right? You can be a half-baked version of yourself with another half-baked version, which was the case in the Song of Songs, and come out fully baked, right? Out of the crucible of love. So Hebrew path seems to be saying it's okay, go for it. As long as you're persevering and, you know, as long as you're humble enough to change, you'll make it. The Greeks are more cautious and prudent, right? They're giving you the advice your mom would give you, right? They're like, be careful, right, daughter? Don't go too fast. Take time to become yourself. Build yourself up. Become a woman, and then you can be in a relationship. They're more the voice, you know, of wisdom. Do you see what I'm saying, Zimmerman? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand if, like, because naturally through relationship, you are, that's what naturally happens. So it's not like, oh, that doesn't happen, or it's a society, or it's, or it's a belief. That actually is what happens to a relationship. So I was trying to understand what they would respond to that because it's just a natural thing that happens. So what, what are you saying happens exactly? There was a plane going through my house as you were talking. So um, no problem. What I was saying was that I, I'm not talking about let's say necessarily a philosophy or a theory. I'm saying naturally through a relationship, a person changes. Ah, yes. Regardless okay. of the view that we're talking about a Hebrew versus a Greek, what would a Greek person say to the fact that it naturally does change your relationship regardless of the theory or philosophy that they're, that they're like, you know, basing it off of? That's what I was trying to understand. 
maybe here we have to listen to Hassan, who thought that the texts were a bit abstract and not able to really <laughs> bring in right all of the facets. Uh, um, so um, maybe Posanias would talk about transformation, since you're in love with an older man, so you're going to learn from him and get transformed, but he's not going to be transformed. Right. So, so in the Greek, to be honest, in general, right, in Greek thought and in Western thought in general, you can find yourself by yourself. You don't need the other to, to become a full version of yourself. The Hebrew thought is the opposite. It's in relationships that you become a full version of yourself. In the Greek thinking, very often, in general, you can achieve, and in Western thinking, which is enrooted in Greek thinking, think of someone like Descartes, you can find your true self by just working on yourself going to school, getting a job. This American way too, right? You can you become yourself, go to school, get a job, blah, blah, blah. And then you can have a relationship in which hopefully you are mature enough to make it work. There is not a concept that the growth is continual and that's why many people break up because they're like, what the hell is going on? All this crisis, what is this, right? In a marriage. They don't realize the crisis is a natural part of marriage. <laughs> it's a growth process, right? We go in the relationship thinking, I'm finished, they're finished. It's not the case. So I disagree here, right? Um, uh, with you, I disagree with the fact that um, we can be fully grown <laughs> before entering a relationship. I, I also disagree uh, with the text. But there is some wisdom to, you know, do a little bit of work on yourself. Does that make sense, Zimmerman? Yeah, so do they believe that um, they're just making it, like once you're fully developed and you're in that relationship, it's just a total... Um, journey of making it work like that's it's, what they it's, it's gonna be harmonious and peaceful there is no growth needed right if you're fully for i mean we know people like that by the way i know people like that they have a perfect marriage they met when they were fully formed <laughs> and now they have this harmonious marriage and they're doing great and i'm like wow and then you have the others who meet when they're half-baked and they're struggling and struggling so yeah the idea thing here i think is that if you're fully formed and you enter the relationship mature it's going to be pretty easy and peaceful and harmonious, give or take, right? So that's, and that's what he's uh, aiming for. He's saying you will have wholeness, peace, right? And if you, if you wait to work on yourself and then find your soulmate. So I think that's what he's saying. The, the, there won't be that much growth needed after that because you're already mature. I think that's what he's saying. He, okay, he would, thank you. Yeah, he would slightly disagree. Uh, Restler, you want to add? <clears throat> yeah, I was just... Um... The question that um, that was just being asked kind of also made me th think that um, I think that uh, at least like my understanding um, of of I, th I think it's the next um, the next person who speaks is that um, he talks about like the nece the necessity of reproduction in um, any relationship, both like on the in the emotional intellectual sphere um, and f physically. Um, so I think that that also kind of lends itself to the the need for growth the the emotional and intellectual um reproduction is the gain the gaining of knowledge and the gaining of understanding of one's emotions and and all that that plays into that so i do think that it must be a greek value to continue growth um within the relationship as well so Respler, you're out of luck because the person who talks like that, Diotima, is not Greek. <laughs> and that's the interesting part, right? She's actually going to sound very different and uh, exactly make the point you make. Uh, so yes, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> very good. Lensman, you want to add? Um, yeah, I was just going to say similar to what someone was saying before about how like you can become better people like when you find that other half, or I guess when you, when you find that um, spouse, I was just gonna, that I feel like sometimes, even if you're not necessarily the same exact person as your other half, and like, you might not, not feel the same way about certain things. Sometimes like, there's just a certain level that you need to be on the same way. This way you can kind of like grow together and like help each other. And in the same direction and like mirror images of each other and it's not like every single thing matches up exactly the same if you're like on the same playing field and maybe that's why you're meant to be together you're meant to yeah. kind of like help each other in those different areas and and fill those voids that you're missing 
Yeah, very good. You're bringing me to the other piece of advice, right, that Aristophanes would give us. Not only be make sure you're, you know, fully formed, but choose someone who has similar values to you. That's another good piece of advice, which, of course, remember, the Song of Songs is going to demolish that, right? Song of Songs, they don't have the same values at all, right? But he would say, and it's a wise also thing to say, choose someone who is like you. Choose someone who has same values, maybe same religion, maybe same culture, maybe. And, you know, this is the voice of caution, of prudence, right? It will be easier to pick someone who is like you and you will have the goal in the Greek thought. And I think, make sure you write this down because this will clarify everything. The goal of love in the Greek thought is harmony and peace. Whereas the goal of love in the Hebrew thought is challenge and conflict, right? That enables growth. So that's why you have two different sets of advice, right? The Hebrew is like, just go for it. And then you'll have challenge and conflict and it will make you grow, right? The Greeks are like, no, we want peace in the home. We want harmony. And so for that, be wise, right? Make sure you're fully formed. Make sure you have the same values. Make sure you reflect each other, right? And in that sense, yes, you will end up with harmony, but the Hebrews would complain, yes, but no growth. <laughs> but at least you'll have peace. So you have to kind of decide, actually. You have to decide if you're going to be a Greek or a Hebrew when it comes to love, right? These are two paths which, in my view, lead, can lead to the same kind of, you know, passionate love. But one is the challenge, the conflict. The other one is more of the prudence and, you know, discernment. And then, you know, if you work your path well, you can end up in a very good place, right? So these are just two opposite paths, right? And you have to decide what kind of person you are, right? What, what, what would you prefer? Okay, let's end with Agathon in, in, two, in two minutes. Um, I'll just summarize it for you. <laughs> Agathon actually, uh, he's on page 29. And remember, he's not actually one of the older guys. He's one of the younger men, and, but they ask him to speak because he's the host, right? He's probably wealthy. He's probably popular. He's one of those, right? He's like um, the high school, what do you call it? The high school jock. Is that how you say it? How do you say it? Um, I'm missing these expressions. Um, anyways, you know, he's that guy in high school who's super popular and everybody, you know, is in love with him. That's Agathon, right? So Agathon is hosting the party, so they, they ask him to speak, and this is where he makes his first mistake, he accepts. <laughs> and, you know, he's just a kid, so what's he going to say? And uh, you'll see that he, as he begins to speak, it's actually the biggest mistake he ever made was to accept to make that speech, and we'll see why right now. I'm going to read part of what he said, and I want you to tell me at which point he really makes a fool of himself because the whole speech is really, is really bad. <laughs> so you'll tell me what he does that is really, uh, really making himself look like a fool. So he begins, page 29 on the top. I claim. Okay, so already we know, you know, what do you mean you claim? Who are you to claim anything? You're 17 years old. Anyways, he claims. Though all the gods are happy, love, if it is proper to say this, is the happiest. Okay, so far so good. Because he's the most beautiful and best. Okay, now here's where he starts to go wrong. He's the most beautiful for this reason. First of all, Phaedrus, he's the youngest of the gods. He himself provides good evidence for this point by fleeing headlong from old age. Because love naturally hates old age. He always associates with the young and is one of them. Okay, he made several blunders there, two that I can find. What are they? What's he, what, what is this speech saying about Agathon that is really embarrassing for him? He has a bias against old people. He what? He has a bias against old people. Yeah, so first of all, he's talking to a bunch of old people, right? So what is he going around saying, love hates old age? Like, who does that? So already on the level of like, just common courtesy, right? What are you saying, right? How are you going to... But he goes on and on about how love is young and beautiful and soft and sensitive and, you know, love is attracted to the young and, you know, come on now. But there's something else he makes, a huge philosophical mistake. What is that? What's the philosophical mistake he makes? Showing his, the depth of his ignorance, philosophically. Now that you know a little bit about Greek thought and Plato's allegory of the cave, 
Where is Agathon? In terms of the cave, inside or outside? Is Agathon in the cave or outside of the cave? What do you think? When he says love it naturally hates the old, always associates with the young. Why does love associate with the young? Because the young are beautiful. They have beautiful what? Minds? No, bodies. Okay, very good. He's No, he's inside, Gogas. <laughs> Gogas, why do you say he's outside? <laughs> Yeah, he's kind of taking the opposite stance of what was um, given when we were initially talking about the allegory and higher love and lower love. So he's essentially taking the stance of lower love. Like yes, he's, exactly. He's like, Go, Gaz, what happened? <laughs> Go, Gaz, you take back your answer. Go, Gaz. You take it back, okay. <laughs> Very good. But Plato, is, Plato, I mean, I guess on. Is in the cave. He's showing how deeply ignorant he is of what true wisdom is, what true love is. He's talking about lust, right? He's talking about, oh, love is beauty. <laughs> love is youth. And of course, not only is he right rude, downright rude, but he's also showing how philosophically immature he is. He's still in the cave, thinking that all that matters is the body and youth and beauty and so forth, right? So, uh, so basically, when you read the speech, you get the sense that Agatha is describing himself right in other words what he's saying is that love is attracted to the young the beautiful the sensitive in other words love is attracted to me if you want to find love come to me be with me I'm gonna show you what love is right so Agathon is really our the narcissist right of the group okay now we've done the three remember I asked you where the blind spot of all three is can anyone tell me did anyone see what is the, they all sound different, but they all share the same blind spot. Can anyone tell me what it is? Anyone figure it out? What's missing from all three discourses? Or maybe I should ask who is missing from all three discourses? So yes, women for sure. <laughs> That's definitely one of the biggest blind spots. But even more generally, when they're talking about love, who are they concerned with? They're preoccupied with themselves. They want to see reflections of themselves. They want to see their mirror, but they're not really thinking about the other or anything in regards to like conflict or anything Very like that. Very good. And Chavez, right, confirms, right? Absolutely, right? There's no sense of the other in these speeches. It's all about the self. Oh, if you want to find love, make sure you find an older man so they will edify you, right? If you want to find love, make sure you find someone like yourself, right? If you want to find love, well, you know, just make sure. Uh, if you want to find love, I am love, says Agathon, right? There's nobody exists except Agathon in that speech. So they all, in a way, make sure you write this down, are putting the self at the center of the love journey, right? I'm looking for love for myself. If I'm, so Posanias, right? Posanias. I want an older man. Why? For the older man? No, for me. So I can be edified by this older man, right? I want my soulmate who will look like who myself. Again, the self is at the center. And Agathon um, is basically saying what a lot of us are saying. Love is about being loved, right? I want, I want to be loved, right? Come to me. I, love is really being loved, right? So this is really something that as I was reading the text, I realized, my gosh, right? The, there's no sense of the other as, you know, a potential challenge or the other as, you know, the conflict element, it's always perfect harmony. Why? Because they're a reflection of you or they are right there to edify you. So make sure you write this down. The blind spot of the three speeches is really that love revolves around the self. It's all about the self. How the self should um, calculate to be with a lover who edifies them or someone like them or eventually someone for them, right? Okay, so when we get to Diotima, who is um, 
the only non-Greek of the crowd, uh, sorry, uh, who was it? That was a wrestler, I <laughs> see you smiling, right? She's a woman and a non-Greek. So it's interesting that Plato brings her to the table. So the next time we're gonna study the Eutima, we're going to move away from this kind of view, this kind of egocentric or self-centered view. We're gonna move into a different territory. So uh, pay attention as you read uh, her, her descriptions um, that we're moving away from that um, perception, from that worldview, from the Greek worldview in general. Okay, good. Um, I'm good. I've done everything I wanted to do. So next time we'll meet is Monday and we'll be Monday, right? Yeah. And we'll be doing uh, Diotima. Any questions? All right. So if you still have questions, you can stay. The rest of you can go. And I'm going to stop the recording.